Hi, everybody. I'm Maria Zuber, and I led the development of MIT's Climate Action Plan. Um, in 2015, the world uh, got together in Paris, and 175 nations on Earth together uh, decided to take action on climate change. And what they decided to do was to have the goal of limiting warming um, since the uh, pre-industrial age to uh, two degrees, with a further goal, a stretch goal, of keeping that warming to a degree and a half. Now, this is an exceedingly uh, challenging goal because of the fact that, as you can see, uh, looking at the uh, temperature chart over there, um, the world has already warmed 0.9 degrees since the beginning of the pre-industrial age. OK, so, um, so what does the Paris goal tell us? OK, here's a plot of global greenhouse gas emissions as a function of time. And um, uh, the orange line is the reference scenario, what I'll call business as usual. OK, um, the uh, national plans corresponds to the, to the Paris Agreement. And guess what? Paris, although it's exceedingly challenging, isn't good enough. OK, if all nations on Earth meet their commitments that they made in Paris, um, the Earth will warm 3.3 degrees C by the year 2100. OK, clearly, um, in order to uh, meet the Paris uh, aspiration, uh, deep decarbonization of our world energy system has to take place. OK, so let's, um, let's look at the consequences of business as usual. Um, two researchers, uh, Fatih El-Tahir of MIT and Suchio Kang of the MIT Singapore Alliance, uh, did a study of the North China Plain. Now, the North China Plain, the Chinese all know this, but for the, for the MIT people in the audience, uh, is important because it is China's most populous and most agriculturally important area. And over the past 50 years, um, this area has started to see more hot days in the summer. And, um, and so the, uh, the plots up here, the middle one shows what would happen um, if uh, the, it's a simulation of what would happen if we keep warming to two and a half degrees. And the right-hand chart that's very uh, disturbingly red shows what would happen with business as usual. And, um, and so one of the issues here is that uh, this area, because it's a center for agriculture, is undergoing great amounts of irrigation. And the irrigation is increasing the humidity of this area. And so we get additional warming um, because more water vapor goes into the air. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. And, and as a consequence, this area has warmed a half a degree more than the Earth as a whole. Okay? In addition, because there is a greater amount of water in the air, uh, evaporation isn't as effective. And there is greater physiological stress of workers uh, who are outside. So, um, so what this uh, research shows is that by about the year 2070 or so, uh, there will be a number of days where even healthy human beings can only spend a short amount of time outside every day. And this would obviously have very negative consequences for, uh, for human health uh, and for China's agricultural system. OK, um, so let's look now at, uh, at what good behavior or meeting the Paris goals can buy us. Um, so what I'd like to show here is the, um, the results of a study that was jointly done between Tsinghua and MIT um, looking at uh, air quality and warming and what the consequences would be um, if China meets its goals associated with the Paris commitment. So thinking about this from a human health perspective, uh, this analysis shows that nearly 100,000 people um, would uh, avoid premature death, okay, and uh, that the savings would be a factor in health care costs would be a factor of four times greater than what it would cost China to actually meet its commitments um, in Paris. 
So meeting the Paris commitments and having a better climate um, really pays for itself many times over. Okay, um, China is not the only part of the earth that is being affected by warming. Um, in Boston, we are used to shoveling a lot of snow in the winter. But this past January, um, uh, an intense storm moving up the east po coast caused extensive flooding um, because it was rain instead of uh, snow. And, um, and what you see on the right-hand side here are um, predictions um, that show uh, the blue area. Let's see if I can point to this. Um, this is Boston, and here's uh, Cambridge and MIT right here. And, uh, and this shows by about the time of 2050 um, that uh, there will be extensive repeated flooding due to the combination of sea level rise um, and storm surges associated with storms like this moving up the coast. And, um, and so the cost of dealing with this um, is obviously immense. So, um, so business as usual is not going to do it. Um, we need answers. Um, and we need to transform and decarbonize um, the, uh, the global energy system. And uh, incremental advances aren't going to cut it. We need breakthroughs. So, um, so let me talk uh, about some breakthroughs. Um, here's one that, whose time has come, I think, and could be a real game changer. Uh, nuclear fusion, okay, the power of the sun. Um, so, Fusion occurs uh, by taking uh, atoms of hydrogen and fusing them into he helium and releasing that energy. Um, this is achieved in laboratory, or it's attempted to be achieved in laboratories. Um, the most common type of fusion experiment is called a tokamak, um, which is a toroidal um, area where a uh, plasma is heated up to 200 million degrees, which is the temperature of the inside of the sun. Um, and the attempt is made um, to get out more energy from the plasma than the energy that it takes to create the plasma and keep it at that temperature. And so this is a great challenge. However, um, in the 1980s, a Nobel Prize was given for super super, low temperature superconductivity, or high temperature superconductivity, and now, um, magnets uh, that uh, take advantage of that discovery that was made several decades ago um, have the ability to have high magnetic fields um, where we believe now at MIT that we can actually what, achieve what I'll call net positive energy, which is taking out, creating more energy that we're actually putting in. And so in order to accelerate um, that realization, uh, MIT uh, postdocs uh, have started a startup company, and the campus is collaborating this. The, the experiment is called Spark. And the attempt is um, to make, uh, achieve net positive energy within the next decade and to make the first fusion power plant within uh, 20 years. Okay? And, um, and if this happened, it could make uh, really substantial progress um, on the climate change question. Okay, um, next, uh, battery technology. So there have been, uh, in the marketplace, real advances in solar and in wind, um, but we have a baseload problem in that those, that energy is not always available, so we need storage. Um, now here's, uh, there was a type of battery that actually was developed 50 years ago. Um, and, uh, and the, it's, a, it's a battery that has salt as an electrolyte and uh, nickel chloride um, as the electrodes. And the problem with this battery is that the uh, membrane that separated the different electrons, ele uh, electrodes um, was made of a ceramic that was brittle. So it was impossible to take this battery and scale it up to the level of the grid. Um, however, um, Professor Don Sataway at MIT um, and his uh, researchers uh, in his uh, group have found a way that one can take a, a uh, steel mesh and put a titanium nitride coating on it, and that this uh, serves just as well as the ceramic did, but it has the advantage um, that it's very robust 
and actually opens the possibility of scale up. Now, there are many other possible uh, battery designs that are being looked at. We need to look at these all, but we're starting to see some real progress um, in this area. Um, the third um, technology that I uh, will talk about that's really necessary um, is, uh, is the idea of achieving negative emissions. So on this diagram, what you see is the effect of carbon dioxide emissions as a function of time. And the blue line there is the current trajectory, which is completely unacceptable. Um, the red line corresponds to what the emissions trajectory would uh, look like um, if we follow the Paris Agreement. And what that shows is in the out years um, of uh, 2100 or so, that we're actually going to have to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. This is what we call negative emissions. And, uh, and the only way to avoid that is if we start to, those other um, uh, uh, gray lines there correspond to trajectories of different pathways to achieve a limit of two degree warming um, that are more aggressive than Paris. And, uh, and the issue there is that we have to start seriously, seriously, seriously decarbonizing um, right now. Okay, um, so um, Professor John, John Deutsch of MIT um, and uh, Arun Manjahar of uh, Stanford actually collaborated to show that for any technology to enable major progress to be able to reduce CO2, it has to be done at the gigaton scale. Okay, and to put that in perspective, a gigaton exceeds the CO2 limited, emitted by all international commercial aviation per year. So the odds that we're going to need negative emissions are actually pretty high. Now, so what are these technologies? Well, we could go low tech and just plant a lot of trees. Um, that's not going to be good enough. We can uh, teach plants to more effectively take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, that work is ongoing. And of course, um, carbon capture and sequestration um, is actually going to be um, essential um, in order to make this kind of progress. And, um, and we, we wish that we could all just stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere today, but especially emerging uh, economies um, need to take the cheapest energy they can. So in the, in the transition before, uh, until we reach um, uh, uh, energy that is affordable and is low carbon, um, we really have to find a way to keep, take CO2 um, out of the atmosphere. So um, things have to change. Uh, they have to change in China. They have to change in the United States. In the United States, we can't assume that these oil wells in Texas can just keep on pumping oil forever. Um, it's not going to work with the kind of energy transition that we need to have. Um, this coal mine in Wyoming can't keep mining coal um, and sending it to... Uh, uh, the United States and other international areas. And uh, finally, um, I'll note that in um, 2013, China announced the very um, aggressive uh, One Belt, One Road program in order to take the old Silk Road um, area and, um, and open that up for trade and also take what they'll call the Maritime um, Silk Road. And the, the uh, idea here is to open up trade routes across Asia, Europe, and Africa. So expanding trade is a really good idea, and it's a worthy goal. However, in order to make this a reality, um, it's going to be uh, necessary to invest in infrastructure along there, in roads and factories, manufacturing. And, um, and so it's going to be energy intensive. Okay, and then once that infrastructure is in place, there are going to be operations, and those operations are going to be energy intensive. So uh, there's really an opportunity here. Um, if this is done in a low carbon manner that's consistent with the reality that we have, it's a real opportunity for global leadership on low carbon economy. If it's just done by building coal plants, um, then all the gains that China is making in investing in clean energy are going to be wiped out by, uh, by growing um, the, the trade here. So, um, so I will end here um, with, a, with a quote um, by uh, my colleague, Pierre Sellers, um, who um, is an astronaut and, um, and a climate scientist. 
and who um, ha passed away last year due to an aggressive cancer. And he leaves um, with a, a, a statement of optimism. And, um, and I am optimistic as well. So, um, so all of the challenges that we see um, in terms of the difficulty of limiting two degrees are based on all of the technologies that we have here today, okay? But there will be breakthroughs. We don't know when they're gonna come. We need multiple breakthroughs, um, but the breakthroughs will come, and so we need to do basic research. We need to scale these things up, and then we need to deploy them at scale. And I will just close by saying, of all the things that we are talking about here today, MIT and China can collaborate and should collaborate, but this is one topic where MIT and China must collaborate. And I'll stop here.